Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we're going to be continuing our reading from the Bhagavatam. <coughs> Canto 3, <coughs> Chapter 5, Text 1. Vidura's Talks with Maitreya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Text 1 So the Devla Swami said, Vidura, the best amongst the Kuru dynasty, who was perfect in devotional service to the Lord, thus reached the source of the celestial Ganges River Hardwar, where Maitreya, the great fathomless learned sage of the world, was seated. Vidura, who was perfect in gentleness and satisfied in transcendence, inquired from him. Pol Pol. Vidura was already perfect due to his unalloyed devotion to the infallible Lord. The Lord and the living entities are all qualitatively, qualitatively the same by nature. But the Lord is quantitatively much greater than any individual living entity. He is ever infallible, whereas the living entities are prone to fall under the illusory energy. Vidura had already surpassed the fallible nature of the living entity in conditional life due to his being a tutor bar, or legitimately absorbed in the devotional service of the Lord. This stage of life is called a tutor bar siddha, or perfection by dint of devotional service. Anyone, therefore, who is absorbed in the devotional service of the Lord is a liberated soul and has all admirable qualities. The learned sage Maitreya was sitting in a solitary place on the bank of the Ganges at Hardwa, and Vidura was a perfect devotee of the Lord and possessed all good qualities, <coughs> all good transcendental qualities, approaching for inquiry. Any thoughts? No. Oh. So if you remember where we left off, it was um, with uh, <coughs> Vidur being instructed by uh, Udav to go and meet Maitreya and explaining to him that actually Krishna had instructed Udav um, to go to um, Badrik Ashram and uh, <clears throat> to talk to the sages, but Krishna, he stayed behind and had conversa continued his conversation with, um, with Maitreya Muni, who had also overheard the conversation between um, Uddham and Krishna, so like that. So now, Vidur, and Vidur, remember, he was very touched by the fact that Krishna was thinking about him, remembering mm -hmm. him when he was about to leave his body. So Vidur has gone to seek out Maitreya. Text two. Vidura said, <clears throat> O great sage, everyone in this world engages in fruitive activities to attain happiness, but one finds neither satiation nor the mitigation of distress. On the contrary, one is only aggravated by such activities. Please, therefore, give us directions on how one should live for real happiness. What a great question. Everyone in this world wants happiness, but most people are just becoming aggravated. Therefore, how do we get real happiness? <clears throat> Excuse me, purport. Vidura asked Maitreya some common questions, which was not originally his intention. Uddhav asked Vidura to approach Maitreya Muni and inquire into all the truths concerning the Lord, his name, fame, qualities, form, pastimes, entourage, etc. And thus, when Vidura approached Maitreya, he should have asked only about the Lord. But out of natural humility, he did not immediately ask about the Lord, but inquired into a subject which would be of great importance to the common man. A common man cannot understand the Lord. He must first know the real position of his life under the influence of the illusory energy. In illusion, one thinks that he can be happy only by fruitive activities. 
But what actually happens is that one becomes more and more entangled in the network of action and reaction and does not find any solution to the problem of life. There is a great, sorry, there is a nice song in this con connection. Quote, because of a great desire to have all happiness in life, I built this house. But unfortunately, the whole scheme has turned to ashes because the house was unexpectedly set on fire. End quote. There is a nice song. Nice song in this connection. Sounds like a nice song, yeah. Uh, the law of nature is like that. Everyone tries to become happy by planning in the material world. But the law of nature is so cruel that it sets fire to one's schemes. The fruitive worker is not happy in his schemes, nor is there any satiation of his continuous hankering for happiness. Mm. There you go, there you have it. Hmm. All right, tick three. What's he doing? Okay. That picture looked crooked just because the camera was at a certain angle. Text three. Oh my lord, great philanthropic <coughs> souls traveled on the earth on behalf of the supreme personality of Godhead to show compassion to the fallen souls who are averse to the sense of subordination to the Lord. Poor Pop. To be obedient to the wishes <coughs> of the supreme Lord is the natural position of every living entity. But due only to past misdeeds, the living being becomes averse to the sense of subordination to the Lord and suffers all the miseries of material existence. No one has anything to do but render devotional service to the Lord Sri Krishna. Therefore, any activity other than transcendental loving service to the Lord is more or less a rebellious action against the supreme will. Mm. All fruit of activity, empirical philosophy and mysticism are more or less against the sense of subordination to the Lord. And any living entity engaged in such rebellious activity is more or less condemned by the laws of material nature, which work under the subordination of the Lord. Great unalloyed devotees of the Lord are compassionate towards the fallen, and therefore they travel all over the world with the mission of bringing back souls back to Godhead, back to home. Such pure devotees of the Lord carry the message of Godhead in order to deliver the fallen souls. And therefore, the common man who is bewildered by the influence of the external energy of the Lord should, should avail himself of their association. Hmm. Thoughts? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, it's that, that film, The Matrix, isn't it? The devotees are on the outside. And they have the knowledge to break the illusion. But it's not easy because illusion is very strong. It is indeed. <coughs> yeah, so I guess two things. One is we need to associate with those persons who have broken free, the Morpheus-like people. And... um we should also become like that. Uh, we should become free so that we can help others to become free. So, at least in the process, we can share with others the words of those who are free. Just like we're here trying to read the words of Srila Prabhupada and the previous Acharyas and Shukadeva Goswami and Srila Vyasadeva. So that we can become free and in the process, hopefully all of us can be connecting in some way because by this hearing process, then we can at least begin to think about the fact that we are actually trapped in the material energy and um, captivated by it. Ironically, trap seems like a funny word because the trap is simply that we're so allured and enamored by the material energy that we don't want to get out of it. So it's it's like the most powerful trap, you know? Mm. Anyway. Text four, right? Yeah. Therefore, 
O oh, great sage, please give me instruction on the transcendental devotional service of the Lord, so that he who is situated in the heart of everyone can be pleased to impart from within knowledge of the absolute truth in terms of the ancient Vedic principles delivered only to those who are purified by the process of devotional service. Purport. As already explained in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the absolute truth is realized in three different phases, although they are one and the same in terms of the knower's capacity to understand. The most capable transcendentalist is the pure devotee of the Lord, who is without any tinge of fruitive actions or philosophical speculation. By devotional service only does one's heart become completely purified from all material coverings like karma, jnana, and yoga. Only in such a purified stage does the Lord, who is seated in everyone's heart with the individual soul, give instruction so that the devotee can reach the ultimate destination of going back home, back to Godhead. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 10.10, one of the seed verses, Tesham Sadatu Yuktanam Bhajitam. Only when the Lord is satisfied with the devotional service of the devotee does he impart knowledge, as he did for Arjuna and Uddhav. <coughs> Vijnanis, yogis, and karmis cannot expect this direct cooperation of the Lord. They are not able to satisfy the Lord by transcendental loving service. Nor do they believe in such service to the Lord. The bhakti process, as performed under <coughs> under the regulative principles of Vaidhi Bhakti or devotional service following the prescribed rules and regulations, is defined by the revealed scriptures and confirmed by great acharyas. This practice can help the neophyte devotee to rise to the stage of Raga Bhakti, in which the Lord responds from within as the Chaitya Guru or the spiritual master as superconsciousness. All transcendentalists other than devotees make no distinction between the individual soul and the super soul because mm. they miscalculate the super consciousness and the individual consciousness to be one and the same. Such miscalculation by the non-devotees makes them unfit to receive any direction from within and therefore they are bereft of the direct cooperation of the Lord. After many, many births, when such a non-dualist comes to sense, that the Lord is worshipable and that the devotee is simultaneously one with and different from the Lord, then only can he surrender unto the Lord, Vasudev. So your devotional service begins from that point. The process of understanding the absolute truth adopted by the misguided non-dualist is very difficult, whereas the devotee's way of understanding the absolute truth comes directly from the Lord, who is pleased by devotional service. On behalf of many neophyte devotees, Vidura, at the very first instance, inquired from Maitreya about the path of devotional service by which the Lord, who is seated within the heart, can be pleased. Hmm. Thoughts? <coughs> Quite simple, really, because the absolute truth is ultimately a person. So it's like you can learn the secrets of the universe through your own research and limited brain capacity, you know, research matter, research stones, or the sea, different elements, and we can get some knowledge of what it is that we're living in and surrounded by. But it won't take you any further than a certain point, and it's very troublesome. At the same time, some bhakta could come in the temple very sincerely, chanting, doing some service, cleaning the pots, or whatever, and due to the service attitude and sincerity, the cause of all this, the cause of all causes, the absolute truth from within the heart can start revealing things mm -hmm. and be known, you know, know things that you couldn't, scientists couldn't know for so many years, so many lifetimes, not years, yeah. lifetimes. And it can just be revealed by <laughs> clean the pot, you know, <laughs> clean the floor, distribute a book, whatever. Mm. Nice point. Very good. Okay, text five. <coughs> <coughs> o great sage, kindly narrate how the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
who is the independent, desireless Lord of the three worlds and the controller of all energies, accepts incarnations and creates the cosmic manifestation with perfectly arranged regulative principles for its maintenance. Purport Lord Krishna is the original personality of Godhead from whom the three creative incarnations, namely the Purusha avatars, Karna, Karanaranavashi, what? Karanaranavashi Vishnu, that's a new way of saying it, Garbhadakshaya Vishnu and Shirdakshaya Vishnu expand. The whole material creation is conducted by the three Purushas in successive stages under the external energy of the Lord and thus material nature is controlled by Him. Thinking <clears throat> material nature to be independent is like seeking milk from the nipple-like bags on the neck of a goat. The Lord is independent and desireless. He does not create the material world for his own satisfaction as we create our household affairs to fulfill our material desires. Actually, the material world is created for the illusory enjoyment of the conditioned souls who have been against the transcendental service of the Lord since time immemorial. But the material universes... <clears throat> are full in themselves. There is no scarcity for maintenance in the material world. Because of their poor fund of knowledge, the materialists are disturbed when there is an apparent increase of population on the earth. Whenever there is a living being on the earth, however, his substance is immediately arranged by the Lord. Other species of living entities who far outnumber human society, are never disturbed for maintenance. They are never seen dying of starvation. Okay. It is only human society that is disturbed <coughs> about the food situation. And to cover up the real fact of administrative mismanagement. Take shelter in the plea that the population is excessively increasing. If there is any scarcity in the world, it is the scarcity of God consciousness. Otherwise, by the grace of the Lord, there is no scarcity of anything. <laughs> Interesting points. <clears throat> I guess, of course, it definitely can be argued that certain animals do also experience scarcity sometimes and maybe suffer... Uh, <clears throat> uh, the effects of a drought or flood or volcano or you know or hurricane or whatever that you know animals may also suffer in that way but i guess the basic principle is you don't see entire economic systems being set up and trade routes like we had this whole suez canal thing Recently, you know, you don't see whole trade routes being set up because of having to ship something from somewhere to somewhere. And everyone's dependent on the management of human beings, making sure they get their goods. You know, a colony of ants or a colonies of zebra or a herd of deer or, you know, whatever it is, wild boars in the street or mice or moles or whatever. They're all more or less self-sufficient. The earth provides, you know, what is that saying? <clears throat> jiva, jivan, something. I can't remember how it goes now. But, you know, you know, one one animal is food for another, basically. And then you have plants, and everything is just existing in a way that Krishna is providing for all living entities. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada often, you know, would state, you know, look at whales, you know, and we know... Whales, the amount of, that a whale eats in one day to sustain itself is probably more than we eat in a, in a year. Hmm. But, you know, but the ocean is providing. But then actually, I guess many of the problems in the world, <laughs> you could argue, are caused by humans. Hmm. Like I think recently there was something in the, news about a polar bear that was having to leave the Arctic and go s coming south 
to search for food because basically the polar ice caps are melting and things are, you know, mm. going in a way so that their environment is being messed about. But anyway, mm. it's an interesting mm -hmm. point. <coughs> interesting point. <coughs> mm. Check six. He lies down on his own heart, spreading the form of the sky, and thus placing the whole creation in that space, he expands himself into many living entities, which are manifested as different species of life. He does not have to endeavour for his maintenance because he is the master of all mystic powers and the proprietor of everything. <coughs> Thus he is distinct from the living entities. Proper. The questions regarding creation, maintenance and destruction which are mentioned in many parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam are in relation to different millenniums, kalpas, and therefore they are differently described by different authorities when questioned by different students. There is no difference regarding the creative principles and the Lord's control over them. Yet there are some differences in the minute details because of different kalpas. The gigantic sky is, is the material <coughs> body of the Lord called the Virat Rupa and all material creations are resting on the sky or the heart of the Lord. Therefore, beginning from the sky, the first material manifestation to the gross vision down to the earth, everything is called Brahman. <coughs> Sarva Bhavidam Brahma. There is nothing but the Lord, and He is one without a second. The living entities are the superior energies, whereas matter is the inferior energy. And the combination of these energies brings about the manifestation of this material world, which is in the heart of the Lord. Hmm. Interesting how it says that he lies down on his own heart, spread in the form of the sky. Yeah. And thus placing the whole creation in that space, he expands himself into many living entities. Any, any no. realization from that section? <laughs> hmm? No. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the explanation of creation, I, I believe that's what's going to happen again. I think that's maybe going to be discussed here a little bit. Um, yeah, there's nothing but the Lord. He is one without a second. Like that. Anyway, very powerful. So, um, yeah, the next one has quite a mm. lengthy purport. So maybe we just finish here. Okay. Unless you want to go ahead and do that. That's fine. You leave it. Okay. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Prantarai Srimad Bhagavatam Maki. Jai.